Good morning, everyone. My name is Roya Kaloya. It's actually that. I rhyme, um, which is awful. I waited until I was eight months pregnant to walk into the Secretary of State office to change my last name. Um, the, uh, I'm from Michigan, and I am a former program director. I'm core faculty now at the residency program, and then I work for US Acute Care Solutions uh, doing clinical education. Uh, so I'm excited to talk to you guys. Anyone from Michigan here? Oh, sweet. Awesome. What part? Very wonderful. I'm in Grand Blank practicing. You're from Michigan as well? Also from Ann Arbor or back in the back? No? Okay. Uh, wonderful. Well, it's great to talk to you guys. Uh, how many people here are excited to deal with sepsis? Super excited. It's the best part of your day. You're so excited to get an email from someone telling you you missed something on the last bundle. How many people get emails regularly? Good. What we're going to do is try to hopefully get us to a point where we can recognize sepsis early. That's one of our biggest issues, is not recognizing it in time. Understanding some of the reasons behind some of the things we're being asked to do, and then hopefully get to the point where we can really um, uh, treat it better so the patients aren't going to decompensate uh, so quickly. As you know, Sepsis has a high mortality rate, right? So many of these patients that go into septic shock, 48% mortality. So what can we do earlier to save them from that? That's what a lot of these things have been kind of, uh, it, what we're trying to do is get our focus on the early part so we can hopefully prevent them from having the bad outcomes in the end. Um, Machiavelli, many, many years ago, described hectic fever as something that is difficult to recognize but easy to treat if you catch it early. And then later, if you, it's very easy to recognize, but it's really hard to treat, right? I would say that that still applies today when we discuss sepsis. Um, in first century BC, back in the Greek times, uh, we had sepsis zero definition, which was uh, putrefication is what it meant. And so that's where the word sepsis came from, decomposition, putrefication. Also probably pretty accurate. Um, th does anyone know who this is? This is a Supreme Court justice um, who decided on, a, when asked what uh, hardcore pornography was, uh, said that he knows it when he sees it. Um, and so I think a lot of us think that, right? We know sepsis when we see it. But actually, we don't. And that's really been the hard part of sepsis. Back in 1991, we tried to find a definition so that we can try and catch sepsis and see if we can identify it earlier. And what's wrong with SIRS? I mean, who has strong feelings about SIRS? Anybody besides me have strong feelings about SIRS? It's everyone. I walk into a shift in the department, and I could easily qualify for two out of four SIRS criteria, right? Um, so it, it was a challenge, and it was a challenge getting people to apply this to every single patient. Is it your AFib patient? Are they sepsis? Are they SIRS? No, they're probably not. The young kid who just uh, got into a motor vehicle collision or has a fractured arm likely has a heart rate that's higher and a respiratory rate that's higher. Are they infected? Are they going to go on to be septic? No. But this was more designed to kind of get us thinking about sepsis. Walk into a room and say, are you septic? Are you going to be septic? I need to identify you early versus late. And that was what it was geared towards. It was just not specific and it was not sensitive. So it wasn't great. The, to follow through that continuum, um, sepsis was SIRS plus an infection. Severe sepsis was sepsis plus organ dysfunction. So now you're seeing like platelet counts being low or maybe renal, uh, some renal issues. Um, and then septic shock is when you're faced with the hypotension that comes with it. So despite giving adequate fluid resuscitation, they're still hypotensive. That's considered septic shock back in 1991. What was adequate fluid resuscitation? We didn't know. But it was adequate fluid resuscitation and they're still hypotensive. 2010, we tried to aim at the definition a little bit tighter, make it a little bit of a cleaner definition. Um, so it was infection plus some of the stuff. So maybe they have fever, some, maybe they're tachycardic, um, maybe they're hypoxic, maybe they have hypotension, they have some of this, and they have an infection, then we've identified them as septic. Severe sepsis was then sepsis, so you've already got some of the stuff, but you also are hypotense, and you also maybe have an elevated lactate, and you maybe also are thrombocytopenic. So you've got a couple of other extra things in addition to having sepsis, so now you are severely septic. Did anyone have a tough time with the term severe sepsis? 
and defining it, right? It seems a little bit redundant. Um, septic shock was then when you've given fluids um, and they're still uh, not responding, their blood pressure is still low, and that was then termed septic shock. In 2016, they recognized, so the uh, society came together and recognized that maybe some of our definitions need a little bit more help. SIR still existed, STIR still existed, um, but it wasn't part of the continuum anymore. So now um, SIRS is just something to use to potentially identify patients. Sepsis was now de defined as life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by dysregulated host response to an infection. So in very, very layman's terms, the body is having a horrible time with this infection and it's causing lots of bad things to happen. So the body's failing as a result of this response to this infection. They decided, along with the rest of you, that severe sepsis was in fact redundant, um, and it was 28% mortality at that point, so I would say that that is severe. So now it is gone from that lexicon, and that was as of 2016, um, but we are now dealing with just sepsis and then septic shock. So septic shock being that patients are still hypotensive despite being, uh, being given fluids, and their lactate is still greater than two despite being fluids, and also having been given vasopressors. Um, the QSOFA score, does anyone use that? No, does anyone know what it is? Oh, okay, good. So, so it's a, so does anyone know what the SOFA score is? So the SOFA score is a bigger uh, score that we don't use in the emergency department. Generally used in the ICU, it helps you see people on a continuum. There's four points across the top, uh, five or six down the bottom, um, and you can put people on different, uh, give them different scores, and you can see whether there's been a change in the score to see if they're worsening or whether they're improving. Um, more than two change would make you believe that they're much sicker and they're getting sicker. So it, it's a very cumbersome tool, the whole score, to be used in the emergency department, there's this quick SOFA score that was developed and they recommended using that. Not as a diagnostic tool, but more of, of a screening tool uh, to be able to think of patients. So kind of like a SIRS, but maybe it'll hope, hopefully help us a little bit more. And that was a blood pressure that was less than 100, respiratory rate that was greater than 22, and a GCS less than 15. So you look at this, you're like, again, it seems very similar to SIRS, right? Uh, who isn't less than 15? Uh, whose heart rate or respiratory rate isn't a little bit higher, greater than 22? Um, blood pressure, I think, is a little bit harder to fake. But if you need at least two of them, this, this also brings in a lot of people into the sepsis continuum, right? Um, the most recent guidelines uh, that came out in 2021 are recommending against using QSOFA alone. So they still want you to use SIRS. You can think about QSOFA, but no one test is the best test to use as a predictive tool, or not a predictive tool, but as a screening tool. So quick SOFA, like we discussed, again, screening tool, not a diagnostic tool. We've, we've gone over how SIRS can be over-sensitive. It can also be under-sensitive, under-specific, but it's still there. Really all it comes down to is thinking about it. You walk into this room, could this patient be septic? And then using some of your other tools to maybe take you down a couple more steps to see if you need to do more testing for these patients. Um, so using them both together, I think the more tools you have in your toolbox, the better, ultimately, for the patient and for you. The problem with this is the new SEP3 definitions, which seem a little bit clearer and which give us a little bit more guidance, are not adopted by CMS yet. And CMS does what? They decide if we get paid, right? So we still have to follow what CMS tells us to do. So whether we want to believe that severe sepsis is redundant and that that definition is redundant is basically irrelevant because CMS is still deciding on how the hospital gets paid. So there are a lot of things that we do because the hospital still needs to get paid. Lactates are one of my uh, favorite things to draw on people, but and that's one of the other things that also go along with it. Um, ultimately, we still have to meet certain criteria in order for the hospital to get paid on the treatment for these patients. So this is more for you to know that sepsis is still, by CMS guidelines, infection greater than or equal to two SIRS criteria, sepsis plus organ dysfunction for severe sepsis, and then septic shock, sepsis plus refractory hypotension, and a lactate greater than or equal to four. Good. Um, so pathophys, we won't go into huge detail on this, but it's more to help understand what is happening with sepsis and how there's an infection, 
and then there's a cellular response. And then when that cellular response continues to proceed, we end up with death, right? And we, with coma seizure death was the old uh, tox adage for everything. Um, but this is for sepsis. It, you start having multiple organs failing, and patients will die. So if we can intervene in that earlier phase, so we're recognizing it earlier, we see an infection earlier, and we start giving antibiotics earlier, then we can hopefully prevent people from having to go down this cascade. 2001, does anyone know Manny Rivers? By the Manny Rivers trial, early goal-directed treatment? You are lucky. Because back then, when that first came out, um, we were doing so many things to people. We were putting pulmonary artery catheters in patients that were maybe a little bit septic because it was shown in his study that there was an 18% reduction in mortality in these patients. Process Arise and Promise set out over the next 10 to 12 years to determine whether it was truly all of the things that were in early gold directed therapy or whether it was Manny Rivers showing up at the bedside of every septic patient and having a very active role in each one of those patients that was really the difference. And so all three of those studies showed that there was no difference between early goal directed therapy and usual care in the outcome of these patients. The PRISM study in 2017 continued to show that as well. So really, early goal-directed therapy was great. It was a good thought, but it was way more than we needed. And what now we're left with is what is usual best care? What is the best thing to do for patients? So the best thing we can do for them is stabilize them hemodynamically. So that's with fluids, with vasopressors, and not being afraid to start vasopressors if the patients need them and if they're not responding to fluids. Obtaining a source control. So where is this infection coming from? Is it something that the patient needs to go to surgery for? Is it something that the patient uh, needs to have removed? What is it that's causing their infection in the first place and getting rid of it? And then managing their complications. So depending on where they are in the continuum of their infection, where do you need to intervene to help them? Uh, is it their their, their thrombocytopenic, is it renal failure, is it they've developed some cardiac disease, so helping support them as, wherever they are on their continuum. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign one-hour bundle. If you have recognized that you think sepsis is very likely and the patient is in shock, they want you to give antibiotics within that first hour. If you recognize that it's most likely going to be sepsis and maybe they're not in shock, they still want you to give antibiotics within that first hour. If you're thinking about it, you're considering that it could be sepsis, they're not in shock, you have a few hours to figure it out. Look for other things that could be causing them to have these symptoms of sepsis um, and, make, and giving you time to maybe find the source, give them the appropriate antibiotics. Broad spectrum antibiotics are still very much the way to go if you don't know what's going on with the patient. Um, and then fluids. We'll get into fluids a little bit more uh, because the newer guidelines do show that it gives you a little bit of wiggle room um, where you don't necessarily have to give every single human that walks in a 30 cc per kilo IV bolus as long as you're documenting appropriately. Um, lactate, lactate can go up for a million reasons. How many of you were, have worked in trauma centers where lactate is automatically ordered on all the patients and it's 16 on that 25-year-old that was in a motor vehicle collision. Of course, it's going to be high, right? Um, and so you have to take every test that we have within reason. Put it and think about it clinically in the setting that we're in. So it's not a perfect test, but we're trying to get to the po to the point where we can develop a perfect test, or that we have something that can really give us a better understanding of how bad the patient is and how septic they are. So. Uh, some people love lactates, it helps them. They do the first one, they do the second one, and they can tell whether or not they're improving or not. For me, I can tell more by going to the patient's bedside. I can tell more about what, are they responding in real time versus waiting for a second lactic to come in. Do I order lactics because CMS dictates that I need to order lactics? Of course I do. Is it on every single order set? Yes, of course it is. But it, does it actually do anything for the patient? Have you had a patient who is clearly septic with a lactic that's normal? Yes. And, and vice versa, can you have someone that looks 
great, and there's lactics maybe like four, and you're like, ah, what do I do with this now? Um, this is a lab test, and what do I do with it? So it's kind of like the partner that ordered the D-dimer that you don't want to deal with. It's, it's how I feel about lactic acids, and I know you, should, you probably shouldn't have feelings about um, lab tests, but I do. Um, and so I, I want you to put it into context, in the context of the patient. Um, Cap refill, the newer, uh, one of the studies of the Andromeda trial, if anyone, or study, if anyone has heard of it, um, they compared a cap refill to lactex and um, going in and seeing if the cap refill is improving or the cap refill is not. And it actually wasn't much different than lactic in telling you how the patient's doing. Do you still need to do lactic? Sure, but um, cap refill could probably give you more of a real-time assessment right there versus waiting for the lab to come back and tell you. Um, the really super sick patients, and I would go back to the Supreme Court Justice, generally you can tell what you're dealing with. Uh, but it's that in between, the ones that aren't quite so bad, that we, I think, have the majority of the tougher time uh, figuring out. And maybe a lactic can help. Maybe if, despite fluids, it's going from four to eight, you're worrying about something else. Maybe it's mesenteric ischemia. Maybe it's something else. So maybe a lactic can help you. But again, I would urge you to use your clinical judgment and, and look at the patient and put it in the setting of what you're seeing in front of you. Good uh, antibiotics, give them as quickly as possible. Every hour uh, that's delayed, they have an increased risk for mortality. Uh, the patients do, so the quicker you can give antibiotics, the more we can potentially help these patients. Um, the, you wanna start them early, get your pharmacist on board. If you have a pharmacist, does anyone have a pharmacist? Awesome. We do too. We just got them last year. They're amazing. I have not, I've never been lazier. Um, I just walk over to them. I ask them all sorts of questions. Um, sometimes it's just questions I thought up before I walked in on shift and they're just happy to answer them. But they're there. They're there to double check you. They're there to go over things with you. They're there to help you when the patient has 35 different allergies to different antibiotics. Um, and you can call them. There's one in the hospital. They might not be in the ED, but they're in the hospital so they can help too. Um, and then this slide looks a little bit weird on your side, it, uh, and it probably looks a little bit weird um, on your uh, handouts as well. Um, but what it should show, I don't know why the pictures are weird, is looking for the source control. So if it's sinusitis, mastoiditis, meningitis, do you need to do something about this infection in order to be able to help treat the patient? If it's endocarditis, do they need a valve replacement? If it's pneumonia or an empyema, do they need a, something else? Do they need a drain put in? Uh, cholangitis, pancreatitis, do they need an ERCP? Um, UTI or pylo, a septic stone is nothing to sneeze at. Those patients can get really super sick, get your urologist in, get them to put the stent in, and get rid of the nidus of infection so that the patient has a chance of improving. Um, and if it's an STI or neck fash, make sure that you get them to surgery if it's neck fash. Um, I had a patient recently, um, slam dunk patient, it came in by EMS, difficulty breathing, already on four liters of oxygen normally, COPD history, I do a chest x-ray, and it's got maybe a little bit of atelectasis, I can call clinical pneumonia with an 18,000 white count, patients being admitted, I call the admitting team, and I said, hey, by the way, I'm getting a CT of the belly because she had like maybe some right upper quadrant tenderness, I don't think it's going to be anything, liver enzymes are fine, bilirubin's fine, I'll call you if there's anything on the CT. And I did it, and this lady was, 350 pounds, was naked when I walked in the room with just a gown covering her. No one was with her to tell me if this was baseline, not baseline. I, so I ordered the CT and I get a call from the radiologist that said, do you see anything in her perineum? And I was like, why would I look in her perineum, sir? Um, this is a lady that came in for shortness of breath. Um, and he goes, it's necrotizing fasciitis. And then I remembered when I, had, I was walking out of her room, um, she was scratching at her genitals. And I was like, ma'am, your curtain's open, you're naked, maybe don't scratch at your genitals. And I go back in, and sure enough, just a slight bit of erythema that could have easily been from her scratching. Uh, I mean, really, could have been, but it was in the setting of having now a CT that showed neck fash was not just a little bit of erythema from her scratching. And then she went to the operating room, and I called 
the admitting team back and said, remember that time I said the CT won't change anything, the patient will still go upstairs? I was wrong. And it was one of those cases of being better to be lucky than good. Um, but it's something to think about. If things don't add up, don't try to force them into something. And if you still can't find a source, look in the groin because neck fascia is going to be there, especially in your diabetics and especially in the patients that can't tell you too much. Looking back, her Q-sofa was probably pretty high. Um, the, and then and if you have a joint or anything that needs to get a washout, try to push your surgeons into doing the right thing for the patient. Because without them getting that source control, then you're just throwing antibiotics at them. They're not going to improve as well as they could with getting that source controlled. Um, fluids, what fluids do you give? How much do you give? Um, one of uh, the, a couple, I love trial names. Salted and Smart both came out and showed that giving a balanced crystalloid like lactated ringers uh, showed la decreased major adverse kidney event in the 30 days compared to normal saline. Make, I thought it was a cute little um, acronym, but major adverse kidney event is what you're looking at. So lactated ringers, better for resuscitation. Um, albumin if they're third spacing, uh, but it's expensive, so just consider that. Um, the amount of it, though, is different. So how many of you are giving the 30 cc per kilo bolus based on ideal body weight? Good. And for those not, you, can, you are very much allowed to give it based on ideal body weight. Um, and then you want to also give your reason for, doc, for deviating. So if you've got that congestive heart failure patient where every part of you says, absolutely not, I cannot give you a 30 cc per kilo bolus, you can say that in your chart as well and say, I do, not, I do not feel comfortable giving this patient a 30 cc per kilo bolus. This is how much I've given them. A lot of those patients, maybe you'll give like a little 500 bolus, maybe another 500 bolus, and you will watch them to see how they're responding. Because what we also know is that you give them too much fluid, and that's harmful for them. So you have to find that sweet spot of what's the right amount of fluid for these patients. And as long as you document your reason, they've got renal failure, they've got heart failure, they've got liver failure, they will decompensate because I gave them fluids, then you're okay and the most recent guidelines support that as well. Um, and then the other part of it is how do you measure the response? What do you do to know whether you've given enough fluids? What are you looking for? What do you guys do? Blood pressure, I heard someone say if the blood pressure is improving, sure, what else? Cap refill is an excellent test, absolutely. How do they look clinically, right? You're looking at them clinically to see if they're improving. Is there a way that we can decide whether they need more fluids or they don't need more fluids? Hmm? Oh, well, that's great. I love that. Yep. Do, are they producing the urine? Or, or is it coming out what you're putting in? Good. What else? Any ultrasound fanatics? Yeah, so ultrasound's great, but ultrasound's going to tell you whether their IVC is collapsed, whether it's full. It's not gonna tell you necessarily whether they could use more fluid or they could not use more fluid. Um, there is a trial underway right now. It's still not completed. It's looking at restricted versus liberal fluids. Um, and uh, so more to come on that. What you can do, or what we know is the trials that they did, the process arise and promise trials, on average, they gave about two liters of fluid to these patients if we're looking at usual care um, in that first six hours. So it, you're not gonna get away with just saying two liters, but if in your mind you're giving about two liters and you're, you're going by ideal body weight, you're doing 30 cc's per kilo, there's no reason why you can't give them those fluids. Um, that was what was in those trials when the patients did okay. Um, that was the ultrasound. So does anyone know what this is? Or has anyone done this? It's passive leg raising. So in the emergency department, you've got the patient there, uh, you lay them flat and you raise their legs, basically giving them an IV fluid bolus, and you're looking to see if they respond to it. Um, there's, there are fancy uh, tools I don't have in my department, but a flow track and a pulse uh, contour device, does anyone have those in their department? You hook up to an art line? No, good, oh great, I, I was like, maybe it's just me. Um, but we, do you have untitled CO2 monitors? Yeah, so you can use the, you can hook them up to the untitled CO2 monitor. If they increase by 5% uh, 
uh, then you can give them more fluids. They can respond to fluids. They still can. Uh, if they don't make any changes despite the passive leg raise, um, then more fluids are likely not going to help them anymore. So you're basically giving them a fluid bolus that you get to take away but when you put your, their legs down, and you're checking to see if they improve. If they don't improve, they don't respond, nothing changes physiologically on them, then you know that giving more fluids isn't going to help them. That they're at their limit for fluids. They don't necessarily need any more. So that's one way to check um, whether or not you need to be giving any more. And this is what the machine looks like, the flow track. It'll tell you stroke volume, so you can see an increase in 10% of in stroke volume when you do the passive leg raise if they're hooked up with the art line to this machine, um, and then you'll know that they can take more fluid, so you can give them more. Um, vasopressors, don't be afraid of them. Um, you can st don't wait for the central line. You can use, as long as you're using a line uh, that is proximal to the antecubital fossa, you can start peripheral uh, norepinephrine. You're good for about 24 hours. You don't want it to be their long-term treatment in the peripheral line, but that'll give you some time to get the central line that the patient likely needs. Um, so make sure that you don't delay giving them the vasopressors. So you've seen the fluids aren't working. They're still super hypotensive. Um, their cap refill is not getting any better. You can start the vasopressors on them. Norepi is the best way to go. Um, after that, if you can add in vasopressin. Epinephrine is just an additional agent you can consider. If they're bradycardic or if they're showing signs of any cardiomyopathy and you need to give them inotropic support, um, you can consider do dopamine, dobutamine. Um, steroids, uh, do you generally give steroids? Or are you giving solucortaf to your septic patients, to all of them? No. If they're, if they're in shock, they're re not responding to fluids and they're not responding to pressors, you can give them solucortaf. You don't need to do any testing beforehand. You can give a stress dose, 100 milligrams, um, and see if they respond to it. Uh, that's just something to consider the next time you're staring at this patient. You're like, what more can I do for you? Um, so treatment summary, initial recess, 30 cc's per kilo per hour. You want to give crystalloids versus giving normal saline. You want to keep their MAP. Your goal is to keep it over 65. Um, thinking about passive leg raising, cap refill, to measure whether or not the fluids that you're giving are working and whether or not you need to give more fluids. Um, antibiotics, make sure you're starting broad spectrum, start them early, get the source controlled, have those difficult discussions with your specialist. A lot of them don't want to come in at 2 in the morning and take a kidney stone out, but if you push them to do the right thing, this patient's septic, they're getting worse, they might say, well, taking the OR might not, but it but it could help. It would definitely help them more than the course that they're going in. So having those discussions with them and telling them that they need, the source needs to be controlled. Oh, whoops, sorry. Um, and then it, steroids, considering that, having that in your armamentarium, um, and pressors, don't be afraid to use them. Give them early, use them. Um, and know that ultimately it comes down to you. You're at the bedside. Look at the patient. You can evaluate them. You don't necessarily need to be waiting for lactics to be able to tell you what you need to do for them. And think about sepsis. Think about it early. Look at the patient. Is that heart rate just a little higher than you'd like? Why is it 104 in this person that's just resting, doing nothing? Could there be something that's brewing? When all else fails, look everywhere. Look at their skin. Is there infection there? Is it in the groin? And maybe you shouldn't have told her to stop scratching. Maybe she was telling you something. Um, and so look at the patient and, and do your best for this patient. And ultimately, all of these rules are just to try, and, to try to help us to do better for our patients to prevent that 40 to 50% mortality that ends up happening once the patients get to the point of septic shock. Protocols are great. They're there to help you. They're not end-all, be-alls. Um, there's going to be times, like we talked about, where patients are going to be they're going to fall outside of it. A lactic's high, but it's not necessarily sepsis. Or a lactic's normal, and it is sepsis. Look at your patient and look at the patient that you have in front of you and do what you think is the right thing for them. Any questions?